Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. Our topics this week, one election ends, another begins. The debate over gun control never ends. Ditto the DACA debate, plus roasted toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and take a look at the state of the economy nationally and in the metro area. There is no one better to discuss these topics with than our guest. He's economist Dr. Chris Keel, managing partner of Armada Corporate Intelligence in Kansas City. Chris, welcome back to Ruckus. Pleasure to see you again. Thank you. President Trump says we are living in the best economy this country has ever seen. Do you think he's right? Right now, he's not far off. I mean, we're looking at growth that is faster than we've seen in probably the last decade. We're thoroughly out of the recession. We have very low unemployment rates. But as most economists, my job is to point out the dark cloud behind the silver lining. All of that growth and all of that low unemployment tends to bring inflation in its wake. And that's the biggest concern we have now, is that by the end of the year, we'll be looking at higher prices. The most recent GDP report, gross domestic product, uh, the total of goods and services mm -hmm. in the United States, hit 4.1% compared to the previous quarter. That's an unusually high reading, is it not? It is an unusually high reading. A little bit was juiced by what's going on with trade and tariff activity. We had an awful lot of companies trying to beat the tariffs and doing a lot of business early. Uh, we've never sold more soybeans to China than we did in the last two or three months trying to beat those, those tariffs. So probably a point of that growth was a little bit artificial. But even with that, you're still looking at growth over 3%. Uh, a number of analysts and the president say the GDP soon could go to 5% and maybe somewhere higher in the fives. Very unlikely. Uh, it's very hard for a country this big to sustain that kind of growth for very long, mostly because it tends to trigger inflation. Uh, it has kind of its own end built into its development. I think it is realistic to have us in the three range for a year or two, uh, which is pretty healthy for the U.S. 2.5 has been our average for the last 10 years. And if we just up that by half a percent, that's pretty good. Chris, how important were the tax cuts and the cuts in regulations to the growth of the economy? They were pretty significant, particularly for the business community. And, and that's just standard Republican right. policy, is it, it is. not? It is. The only thing that was different about this is it came a little bit later than... And it the, actually happened. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the expectation was that if you're going to do a tax cut, you do it a little deeper into the recession, maybe in 2014 or 2015. But business took advantage of it, a lot of investment, um, a lot of expansion. The consumer didn't really respond too well at first, but they sort of caught up when the summer arrived, vacation spending and the like. So right now, the big question is, will they continue to spend into the consumer half of the year, which is really starting about now. Looking a year out, how do you see things for the national economy, and then how do you see things for the local economy? I think our biggest threat will be inflation. I think by the end of the year, we'll start to see pretty significant inflation. Then we have to watch the Fed to see how fast they will clamp down. But we have inflation because things are going well, right? right? Exactly. We're having inflation because we're seeing growth. Uh, we're having inflation because the unemployment rate is low. If we manage that inflation, it won't take that much of the wind out of the sails, but it'll take some. If the Fed has to clamp down hard, that's when you begin to worry about a short but sharp recession, kind of like we had in the 80s. When you listen to business news experts talk about Wall Street, they say volatility is there and it's there to stay, meaning you'll see the market fluctuate dramatically day to day right, or right. within the same day. Is that your expectation? Yeah, as well? and it's also sort of added to with the uncertainty over trade patterns, um, which is part of what's making the market nervous now. We don't really know what the expectations are with Europe, with NAFTA, with China. 
one minute we're at war, the next minute we're not, um, and that creates a certain amount of uncertainty. Are you concerned uh, then about the tariffs and the battle between the U.S. and now China over raising tariffs? I am a little bit less worried about China as I am with just the general steel and aluminum tariffs. We're not a steel country. We are a manufacturing country, and right now we're sort of hurting the manufacturer to help the steel maker, which is kind of odd because one's much bigger than the but other. But the U.S. has always had tariffs. It's always. just a matter of raising the tariffs, and that's we've always had very battle. high tariffs against China. I mean, it's much higher than they are now, and and deservedly. China does a lot of things that are inappropriate for a trading nation. If I recall correctly, although I wasn't living at the time when this country came into existence, that's where we got money for the government was through tariffs. Right, exactly. No I mean, That's how people became wealthy in Cornell University. Great. See you, sir. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Economist Dr. Chris Keel. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Annie Presley is a publisher, author, and political fundraiser. Gwen Grant is president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. Mary Ann Murray Simons is a freelance writer and consultant. And attorney Steve Marakian is with the firm of Worsh, Hobbs, and Marakian. Mr. Marakian's wardrobe this week is from the Paul Manafort collection. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ga oh. Mr. Gates bought these all for me with stolen money. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming in. A lot to talk about. The results of Tuesday's bi-state primaries are in, sort of. Uh, by now you know the outcomes, sort of. <laughs> we'll look back at some of the races and offer our ideas about what the results mean. Let us start with the race for governor in Kansas. Who were the winners and what can we infer from their victories? Marianne. Well, Laura Kelly won on the Democratic ticket, so we know who our uh, challenger will be. On the Republican ticket, it's a little bit different. Um, we've got 191 votes separating Chris Kobach <sighs> and uh, Jeff Collier, and we don't know what the outcome is. There are provisional votes out there, five to 10,000, I'm told, and we have to wait for that count, which could come as early as Monday. It could take weeks, we're not sure. <laughs> and there's a lot of talk out there right now, Mike, about the possibility of a recount and what the impact would be on the state. All right, we'll get back to this in a moment. Another closely watched race was for the U.S. House from the Kansas 3rd District which includes Johnson and Wyandotte counties. Who will be on the November ballot? Steve. Well, Kevin Yoder will be on from the Republican side. That's no great surprise. The surprise was that he didn't get as much of a, of a turnout or vote as he as expected. I think that'll change when more Republicans will actually turn out. It was clear he was going to win this primary. The, the, uh, the, the, the favor the Democrats did for themselves, quite frankly, is by, um, by nominating uh, Ms. Davis. Had, had it been uh, Brent Welder, it would have been Yoder in a walk, easily. Uh, Davis will be a, a formidable can, a, a, a candidate and, um, and, and quite a challenge. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is going to be a close one. Um, Yoder, is, the, the mistake she'll make if she does it, and I don't know that she will, but she's already sort of starting this, unfortunately, is if she tries to brand Yoder an extremist, she'll lose big. He's not an extremist, and everybody knows that. If she campaigns sort of against the Trump agenda uh, in Johnson County, she'll play, it'll play pretty well. All right, one of the main attention getters in Missouri was Proposition A, dealing with compulsory union membership and dues. How did that one turn out, Annie? Well, it lost. <laughs> uh, lost big. <laughs> big, surprisingly. And um, I think a lot of people were just shocked. But the basic tenet of this was that the uh, union spent Fifteen million dollars, mm -hmm. while the um, others were only able to come up with about three million. So that pretty much tells the story. Also in Missouri, incumbent Jackson County Executive Frank White faced opposition in the Democratic primary. Did he win, Gren? Yes, he won, and um, he actually won. You know, had a really huge victory. Uh, but he didn't really have a, an opponent of note, so he won on name recognition and the fact that everybody just loves Frank White. And, and he'll face essentially no opposition and no in the opposition fall election. And no opposition going forward, so we have four years of Frank White as county executive, and we hope that in the next four years that he will grow in his ability, in his capacity to lead as the county executive and understand that his job is a political 
job and he's got to learn how to be collaborative with the county legislature and he's got to address the Jackson County jail issue. Mm -hmm. So hopefully he'll get those things mm -hmm. done. The community gave him, the electorate gave him a vote of confidence and I hope he can live up to that vote. Marianne, let's go back to the governor's race. The provisional ballots have to be counted, another <clears throat> eight, ten thousand it is said. Right. So if that turns out to be really close, and let's say Kobach is slightly ahead of Collier, the governor has the right to demand a recount, which would take several more weeks. That's right. And the Secretary of State, Chris Kobach, determines how much money it will cost the candidate for requesting that recount. Not millions. Like millions. Seems, <laughs> not seems not like kind of a conflict of interest to me. Absolutely. But uh, Collier has uh, said publicly that he thinks if it's within 10 votes, maybe there should be a recount. Yeah. If it's anything more than 10 votes, he doesn't think it's really worth it. I'm not sure that that will end up yeah. being the case. I don't know what the outcome will be, Steve, but as I think back, and, and I've not done any research on this, this is just my memory, which is to say the least faulty at times. Yeah. <laughs> it seems that I don't remember any incident, any campaign where the person who was ahead at the end doesn't win when there's a recount or when there's a count of provisional ballots. Well, my memory is equally bad as yours. However, I, I agree that's normally the case. I, I don't know, I mean, this, this idea of 10 votes, I, I would think if I were Collier, I might ask for it if it were 100 votes. Mm -hmm. A 10 is, you know, but nevertheless, I don't think Jeff Collier will ask for a recount if, if he loses. I don't think he will. And I think he, he's, a, he's a decent man, and I think it would cost the state a lot of money. Quite frankly, I think from the Republican standpoint, that the real question here is, is if Kobach should win, I believe Laura Kelly will likely win because I don't think the Collier voters will come out in droves for Kobach. The Kobach voters, in my view, will support Collier. Did both of you vote <coughs> in Johnson County on Tuesday? I did. I did advance Did you have voting. any? Okay, mine you didn't deal with the machines. Did mine you mine is the, the one that's going to put one of them over the top. <laughs> did you have problems with the voting machine? No, I just sent mine in. I, we mailed oh, okay. ours so in. So neither we're, of you we're too were old. there. We don't, we're, we're old folks. But uh, what, new $10 million voting machines Ten and a half million that didn't dollars. work as well as hope. Well, it wasn't the machines. It, <laughs> it was, was the, the technology. Yeah. Right. And they were not <laughs> counting as quickly. No, it was the hacking. It was the well, hacking. With, <laughs> without regard to Johnson County, is it weird to think that in an age of high technology you can't get all the votes counted yeah. even the provisional votes counted in a short period or that of time. you wouldn't so have that, tested it ahead of time yes. to make sure that that yes. would not be an issue. Know the results the night of the election or at least the next morning. Yeah, yeah it was unfortunate. Yeah. Nightmare. Okay. Yeah. Missouri's big city mayors Sly James and St. Louis Chief Executive Lyda Crewson met in Kansas City last week with the state's governor Mike Parson the visit gave the mayors a chance to sound off on what they perceive as the need for more city control over gun laws and regulations. The state legislature, dominated by rural interest, has seemed unconvinced by big city arguments in the past. Governor Parson, a former sheriff and small town legislator, was noncommittal. So what about this idea, Steve? Should Kansas City and St. Louis have greater control over gun laws and regulations? I don't think so. <coughs> I'm, I'm one of those people who believes that that uh, the state should control and regulate gun activity within the state and it should not be passed down to the to the communities precisely because I believe we saw this in Kansas, we see in other states. There is so much confusion when we start having different communities having their own regulations. Uh, I think that's a problem. I think there are some constitutional legal issues which some of the courts have found with, with which I agree. And more importantly, I think we see across the country that cities such as Chicago, for example, it's a prime example, Chicago, Washington, D.C., they have very, very strict gun control, very strict, stricter than, than the state at, at large, and they have some of the highest crime problems related to guns. I don't think the issue here is the question of whether cities can control guns. It goes back to all the issues that surround this entire gun problem, and there are many. There are social issues, psychological issues, mental issues, all kinds of things. But passing more regulation in a particular state or city and allowing individual cities to control and having different views between whether you're going to Kansas City, you drive to Lee Summit, you drive to Blue Springs, you drive to, to, to Joplin, I don't think that's the answer. You mentioned Chicago has some of the strictest gun laws in the country. 
Do you know how many shootings there were in Chicago last weekend? You know, I believe there was something along the, along the, along the lines of about 100, I, if, if my memory is correct. I, I thought it was 71. Yeah, well. Okay. So it wasn't nearly that bad. No, it was, this was a light weekend. <laughs> and and in Kansas City last oh. week, what was 13 shootings? Yeah, here's in a 24-hour period. It was crazy. Crazy. Mm -hmm. crazy. Gwen, what do you think about the, the local control of gun laws and regulations? Well, I can certainly understand the mayor's frustration. Um, you know, the, the the state laws need to be fixed to have uh, uh, the right to conceal and carry without uh, regulating that more effectively. You want it's people why, to have to go to I a mean, class? Gonna, and, yeah, absolutely. You need to have some training. You should you shouldn't have any prior that's the way it uh, was before, convictions. Right? You mm -hmm. certainly shouldn't have any history of, <laughs> of spousal abuse. Uh, there are just a number of things right. wrong with the state law. So naturally, the, the mayors of these of local jurisdictions are going to want to see some changes, and I don't blame them. I mean, I think gun gun control in America is a complex issue, as Steve has said, and I think that we have to do much more to address that problem. We continue to see people die in, you know, in mass because folks can have uh, all of these like uh, military grade weapons which are unnecessary for sport or to protect your home. So I think we just need to revisit this on a national level and at a state level. Annie, if new gun purchases were completely eliminated in Kansas City, Missouri, wouldn't all the remaining weapons still pose problems? Well, sure, they're here and they're here to stay, but I think the bigger issue that we're kind of skirting around is the fact that the guns that are actually be being used in these horrible crimes, as a general rule, are illegal. They started illegally, they're staying illegally. They're getting yeah. dealt in parking lots and pawn shops and different places that there are no way it's legal. So unless we start dealing with that aspect of it, it doesn't matter how many rules we have on the books. Mary Ann, if the cities could regulate more closely gun sales, gun regulations, what should they do? I'm not sure that it's a city issue. I agree with Steve. I think it's, it's got to go back to the states and it's got to be a national conversation about what's happening. The local issue in my mind is really about controlling crime and controlling the environment. So it's more of a police issue? I think it's a huge police issue. Well, you know, I, so it's a complex issue. Yes, mm -hmm. it's one, certainly there's a crime control issue, but it goes to uh, what Steve said earlier around the social, the social uh, economic issues. <clears throat> there are so many things that need to be addressed when we start talking about crime and the rise of crime and then what's going on in our communities. Uh, that just gun control alone won't fix. Steve, it gets kind of dicey when you deal with Second Amendment issues. Absolutely, and and again, it goes back to this. We don't, we couldn't even begin to touch it in a program like this. It would take months, if not years, to dissect all the Second Amendment Second Amendment issues. However, the important thing I think is that we start with the notion, and we never forget that, like it or don't like it, we have a Second Amendment. Okay, and it's very important because a lot of people like to sort of gloss over that. We have a Second Amendment right, and we, everything has to be built from there. We sure certainly have to address the issues, as Gwen mentioned, as I mentioned, Marianne. We all said there are social issues, economic issues, psychological issues, mental health issues. All these are important. I am not a purist with the idea that there can be no government restriction or regulation. But all those regulations stem from the Second Amendment, which is just as important as the First Amendment, and we don't ask people, do you have more speech rights than you really need? Do we? I, I do, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. I don't need all well, these programs. Yeah, certainly the, words certainly don't the kill. answer is yes. Words don't kill. Oh, they so can make you feel bad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, hurt my, they hurt my feelings. But DACA, <laughs> Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, is an executive order created by President Obama in 2012. It granted young people brought illegally to this country as children the opportunity to stay if they met certain requirements. When President Trump took office, he issued another executive order saying DACA was unconstitutional and would be nullified in six months unless Congress took some action. Congress, of course, failed to do so. Now the courts have stepped in to keep DACA alive, saying the Trump administration has failed to offer a legitimate legal rationale for ending it. Gwen, why does this issue seem so hard to resolve? Politics. 
it's as simple as that. I mean, you know, the, the law, the complexities of the law, I think, can be worked out. The problem is, on both sides of the aisle, it's not necessarily in either party's best interest to find the solution, especially now as we approach midterm elections. Uh, you know, so the, the, the Democrats, uh, Schumer and Pelosi, went to Trump and tried to, you know, reach a compromise to get the budget, uh, you know, passed, and they did that only to be betrayed by the president. So then that made things much more politically difficult. And then, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. It's not going to happen in the near future, I don't believe. It certainly so, won't happen before the midterm. So what happens to these people who are here as DACA residents? They just stay. We, we have to wait for the courts to weigh in as, as, as the judge. Steve, that's right. a, a lot of people, Steve, including President Obama, said he couldn't issue an executive order creating DACA. He said it would be unconstitutional. He didn't have an authority. He finally went ahead and do this. He was so. right, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so didn't President Trump have the same legal right to yeah. undo it? Yeah. This, this is, a, as Gwen said, this is a very complex issue, and the problem, before I answer your question, the problem is is political in the sense that neither side wants to fix it. Okay, Ryan and his quizzling group, they don't want to fix it, and the Democrats certainly don't want to fix it because it helps both parties, they think, in terms of a political issue. It's, it's dastardly. It's killing the American people. It needs to be fixed. However, in answer to your, your question, the irony here is this. Okay, and this is where we have the problem with what I call progressive judges who don't understand or will not enforce the Constitution. The irony is this. The president was absolutely right. Obama was, was absolutely right. He did not have the authority to create this through executive order, but he did. Fine. The thing about executive orders is, under our Constitution, what can be done by executive order can be undone they by executive order. They are not the same thing there, as a law. There, there, is no, there is no requirement in our law for a federal judge to say, President, Mr. Trump, you have to give a rational yeah. basis. He can strike an executive order tomorrow, any time. And now what the courts have done is basically said, we're going to take an executive order and treat it as if it's legislation, and now, Mr. Trump, you must come in and give us a compelling reason why you can't use an executive order, which you're allowed to do under the Constitution. It's nonsense. Marianne, so I think if the nonsense. Democrats in Congress would give President Trump the money to build the wall, he would give them all sorts of concessions. And, and it's get never going to happen. Do you, do you agree that what he wants is the war? Talking about making <laughs> rational that? decisions, it just is not going to happen. But you're but overlooking one really important component of this argument, and it is this. Because he's been so outspoken, President Trump, immigration is down. Illegals are down. There are so many fewer people coming to America as a result of his saying, I'm going to build a wall. We're going to separate you from your kids. What no one else has really actually taken on, he did take on, and he's been a little loud. But the DACA about people it. are here, and that's the, immigration may right, be down, Ill yeah. illegal. But the question was, is when and, I mean, the, the idea is, what do we do with those who are here illegally, but have been here, and now we have a situation which should be corrected by Congress? There's no question about it. This is congressional action that should be done. Obama shouldn't have done what he did. Trump shouldn't be having to do what he's doing. And, but, but the problem is, when it goes back to Congress, these quizzlings in Congress simply won't well, act. Obama did what he did because he couldn't get anything but he, done absolutely. in, in but Congress. He didn't have the so right he had to, to do that's it. The so that's, so that's the problem. So, when would a wall be a bad it. idea? Would it absolutely be such a bad a idea? Would, Why? You know, I think that there are so many more ways that you could better control the borders than building, erecting a a multi-billion dollar wall. No, I mean, you can use no. technology. There are a number of ways you can do, you, a number of things you can do. Does Israel think, have a wall? But here's the thing. President Trump it said he was going to give Mexico to pay for wall. the wall. That's what no, he, he campaigned on Mexico no, paying for the wall, not the United States. So, he, you know, call him on that. The answer to your question, very quickly, I know we got to move on. Okay. It, it, yes, the, the Jews have a wall, yeah. and it works. And secondly, it doesn't harken back. The Berlin Wall yeah, was by communists to keep people, people in. in not Comparing a wall yeah. to keep Im illegal immigrants out to the Berlin Wall is, in my view, unfair. Okay, now we're going to head to the soapbox, speaking of unfair, for <laughs> Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to scandalize, analyze, or compromise. And we start with Gwen. Oh. 
So I thought. There you go. You're all. So I'm going to toast the the uh, Missourians who showed up at the polls to uh, overwhelmingly uh, defeat Proposition A, I, AKA right to work, and to salute the Kansas City voters who, who <coughs> voted uh, in support <coughs> of the Kansas City Healthy Homes in, uh, Initiative. This is a great step in protecting renters in Kansas City. Mr. Morakian. I recently read Charles Krauthammer's uh, Redread, actually his brilliant book of essays called Things That Matter. Ironically, while I was doing that, the New York Times hired openly racist cop hater Sarah Jong to its editorial board. How sad. This once great paper has now dropped any pretense of fair commentary and has made public discourse a great deal more crude and divisive. By comparison, read Krauthammer's Things That Matter. Charles was a voice of calm and rational sanity in an increasingly hysterical and insane world. I'm going to miss his essays. Mostly, I'll miss his humanity, decency, and intellect that made this world just a little bit better. Annie. I am toasting all the volunteers who showed up on Election Day to help the rest of us actually vote. As a former Kansas City Commissioner Election Board, it is a world of work to get all that gear out, people noticed up <coughs> and through the polling places, and I just want to toast all of them. Marianne. I have a roast to Kansas Secretary of State and potential gubernatorial candidate Chris Kobach for saying if needed, he'd oversee the recount of the gubernatorial election. He sees it as just sort of a ceremonial role. He doesn't see a conflict of interest at all in overseeing the recount that he clearly has a vested interest in. This lack of political awareness demonstrates that he is not the right guy for the job. Finally, here's a toast to Tom Horton of Shawnee who wrote this letter published in the Star last weekend. It says, a simple question for the Star's editorial staff. Has Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach ever done anything right, pun intended? In case you've not had a response, Tom, the answer is yes, if it turns out Kobach loses the gubernatorial primary. And that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Rockets and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.